and they were all right, and they decided to do like the volcano on me this time. They blew, they blew on me so my blood was out. I had to get some transfusions. So that's why I'm just coming out of the hospital. So I'm so happy to be here, and I'm happy to see this demonstration. You can enjoy this. And I got a big surprise for you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that's never good. <laughs> a big surprise, because you know, gumbo zerb is something we do once a year on Holy Thursday. I don't know how many are Catholic, but that is the Thursday before Easter Sunday. And you know, if you're one of those old time Catholics, you didn't eat anything on Good Friday. They didn't allow you to eat a thing. You had to fast. So you had this hearty meal made with gumbo there, with the greens, and we put a lot of meat in it, and that was it. You couldn't have anything until that was over on Saturday. So I'm hoping you will enjoy this. And then I got a couple of little surprises for you anyway. I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> uh, are you, are you going to let me uh, do the zap or are you going to come do it? Or are you going to help? You just tell him what to do. Calvin puts me in the trick bag every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day. But look, I'm all set up over here, see? Yeah, you're all set up. Let's see how set up you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I got my. I got my onion, I got my celery, I got bell peppers, I got my smoked meat, I got my, my, my roast, my brisket, and I got my seven greens, okay. just like you told me to do. Okay, all right. So what you want and me to do? Green. Yeah. So we're going to start off with the meat, let's start taking the meat a little bit. Okay, I'm going to let that get a little bit hot right there. I got my little pot on, yeah. that's on high. You know, this, these things don't get hot too fast, and I didn't know when you were going to get here. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I'm here, and when you say come, you gotta run. <laughs> you gotta run. I told him in the hospital, I gotta get out of here because I gotta go to work. <laughs> so we have a little vegetable oil down in there. Now, of course, we can put a little bacon fat in there, or we can put a little something like that. Yeah, yeah. you can use the bacon fat or whatever fat you want in here. But what the idea is to We're going uh, we to have the same trouble y'all had in the kitchen yesterday, right, with our little barn. So, oh, it's starting, to, it's starting to make a little noise. So we have a little, we have, just have a little uh, meat here, just a little stew meat. I'm going to throw it in there. Now, it, it, didn't, it didn't really matter what meat you put in, you know, Leah? No. But, you know, the Creoles always put stew meat in it. And I don't know why we even put stew meat in our regular gumbo. The veal stew really has very little flavor compared to the ham and the sausage you can use in here. But I think it was to stretch it, they like meat, and the flavors blend in. The stew picks up the flavors from the other smoked meat. So veal would have been would have been used at uh, uh, whatever meat was available probably. Yeah, yeah veal would have been used. I never knew why. Did the Cajuns use a lot of veal? Well, veal was always a product of a, a second little bull that was born on the on the farm. All the Cajuns and Creoles normally had a little one cow or one calf or something. But if there was a baby born and it was a bull, you weren't going to raise a bull. So you just brought it to enough weight to be able to bring it to the butcher and sell it so that you could get that veal money. So, uh, That's why I never knew why we ate, we didn't eat very much meat. We ate veal. Because yeah, veal was the cheap thing, and, if, uh, and there was no refrigeration, so you couldn't kill a calf, a little a veal calf, and then, uh, and then preserve it any kind of way, unless you smoked it, and you didn't want all the meat smoked. Uh, so so you, you, you use whatever meat you could get. And uh, so you would just uh, brown that really nice on a nice high fire that would mean you get the water and tell that steam coming out of it. You want to brown it really yeah, nice. Cook it really good. Yeah. Huh? Mm. So what else you got from here? Yeah. Well, you, you got me a little bit. Well, I just threw a little bit of that, man. You want more? No, that's enough. 
Yeah, they do. They, they add a sweet note to the dish. Uh-huh. That's right. 
I'm gonna have some collard. That's some collard green. Try that. Cut it. Collard green and musty green make it a little bit hardier. Yeah. And this is and a it, good healthy mixture. And look at look at the different colors on here. Yeah. Uh, and now this is obviously gonna cook uh, all all the way down in uh, in the yeah. pot. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna need to Just give me about a, 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 a maybe one of these of uh, hot water. Here we had collards, we had mustard green, we had cabbage, we had kale. Well, I said kale already, uh -huh. and this right here was the spinach. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, you may have had some. Uh, some no, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait. Wait a minute, John. You're gonna mess this whole thing up <laughs> because you know one thing you have to remember. You have to have uneven numbers of greens. Well, baby, I got seven. What's, what's even in your land? I thought I missed one. I thought I had huh? six. Yeah. See, I you went to school in the city. I went to school in the country. You had to know how to add. I thought, I thought he had six. I said, I, I bad luck. You know, you have to have uneven numbers. You have five, seven, nine. Uneven numbers. Even numbers, bad luck. And you don't want that. Because, you see, when you eat this and you invite your guests over, then they will acquire a new friend for every green they have in the pot. And we always tell you, one will be rich. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, see how good that looks? And it's even beginning to. Yeah, now it's starting to agree. Now, mm -hmm. now all the greens are starting yeah, to add that liquid to the bottom of the pot. But you got a little time there. I got a couple little things here for you. I got a little time. Okay. A fresh time out the garden. I have just a little bit garlic. Yeah, come on, put in garlic. There just a little go. bit. That's two tablespoons in that yeah. little pot. Garlic is good. Garlic good to the blood. Uh -huh. Now I'm gonna put you. Now remember that. Remember we have smoked meats in there, but we still need to season those yeah, greens. Yeah, because you a need to green, green take a lot of food. Yeah, they do. And then I'm gonna put just a little touch of cayenne, and now you can use black pepper, cayenne, whichever one you want. I like I like the cayenne. It gives better than yeah. that. But look at it, if y'all can see inside the pot, you see the moisture is coming in. You see how it's coming out? Yeah, it's coming out pretty good. The greens are getting soft and And you're getting that nice uh, look down in the pot, too. Okay. And then I'm going to add a little bit of flour. We put just a little bit of flour to, to just kind of... Hey, you want a little up. viscosity in the finished dish, even though the greens are going to put a lot of that thickness in the pot. Just a little... I don't want to put it in too early because I don't want little uh, rhubarbs in here. I want kind of the steam to come out yeah, so that we can. See how uh, good that is. Put yes, a little flour. I'm gonna put a little flour right there for you. See, and that's a thick enough. Now that's gonna thicken it up. Michelle, that was fantastic. Huh? Thanks. That was fantastic. I think that's probably the first time you ever did anything. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I want to say anything that's not true. I mean, I think it's the first time I think I ever saw cook anything, Lee. Huh? Not a cook. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to eat. First thing me and Leah agree on. <laughs> okay, now Leah, I'm gonna put a little bit of this nice uh, liquid in here. Uh, we we could use a little uh, the stem. We can make a stock of the stems. We could do chicken. Uh, say, and we normally throw ham, but like the, the bones of the ham, the stems of the greens, we put in the pot to make a really rich stock and just kind of cook that away. Yeah, rich and the minute yeah. we put this uh, water in here, like I said, we put a, a, a stock. Our, our stock would be smoky too, like that ham stock y'all had yesterday uh -huh. when you boil that ham bone. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then always at the end is the filet pound. Oh, yeah, I know most of you know about the filet, but the filet is the ground leaves of the sassafras tree. And the sassafras tree, uh, this by the way was an Indian, a Native American Indian coagulant. If they were running through the, through the swamps or uh, ripped their arms open, they would pack it in filet. And filet uh, would kind of dry on it and stop the bleeding, uh, and, and it would be a, 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 a healing herb as well. Uh, the flavor is uh, kind of very earth tone, but the leaves of the sassafras tree 
a pick in when they green in August. You gotta let them get to August because once it gets to the end of August, they start to dry out. We cannot have them that way. You have to take them off of the tree while they're still very pliable. So we clean all the leaves off of the sassafras tree, put it in a, a, a blanket or a pillowcase or, a, or a, a, a linen bag of some kind, and we tie it tight in the cages, at least is what we did, we brought it into the attic of our house. And we let it sit there until November where it, did, where it dried out totally. Look at you. Look at you. I know you want to do something like that. You want a little more green. Let me give you some of this dark. Uh, let me give you some of this dark. Um, so we would put it in the attic, and of course we had 10 roofs on the on the cabins, and the 10 roofs would be at it'd be 120 degrees up in that attic, and it would dehydrate the leaves, and dehydrate them to a point that we could, and we had a round log, and the round log was a cypress log that had a nice hole cut out in the middle, and we put the leaves down and then we kind of crush them with our hands, and then we take a pole and, and we um, pulverize them until we had this right here. And uh, this is a thickening agent, so if we put it in the pot, it will thicken, it'll flavor, and the flavor of this is actually a lot like thyme, I think. It's a lot yeah. like thyme, so you don't want to over, yeah, but like you, might, you might want to, yeah, you might want to pass that around, and you can even take a little bit. But this is just, and you can see how clean it is, because after we pound it in that, uh, in that mortar, that wooden mortar that we have, uh, then, uh, by the way, we had a small one next to the stove in the house, too. So we had a big one outside on the porch, and when you came inside, there was a little one that you could just, I'll say a little one, it was about three feet tall and about maybe a half a six inches long. And uh, then we would uh, uh, pound, the, the, the pound it more if we needed to. And then we'd run it through a little sieve, a little uh, screen to get it like this. Y'all yeah. pass that around and uh, take a little pinch of it. Uh, and if, if you're making, uh, what we call a salmi de la pain, which is a rabbit stew, you could put that in there. I think somebody did a salami. Did somebody do salami yesterday? Uh, one of the cooks? I think maybe a salami, a rabbit? Or? Yes, that what we, yeah, that's a salmi de la pain. Yeah. It's a stewed rabbit, and that would go good in, that filet would go good in that. And filet, you know, you, you can do, it's made with the sassafras. The sassafras leaves, yeah. So you can make a tea with it, it can be medicinal. And um, uh, did I tell you the filet story about my mother and filet? No. You hold it back, <laughs> go ahead. My aunt, when my aunt would come to visit, you know, mother, they would make sweet things like sweet potato pond. Yeah, yeah, little hand pies or sweet potato pond, like y'all uh, had the hand pies. And pie. we had a wood stove. So the sweet potato pond was hot, and the wood stove had the little front to it. My aunt took the pan a hot um, sweet, sweet potato pond on the front of the stove, and it falls on a foot. The foot was burned to no end, and out comes the filet. <laughs> Half filet on it, and she said, so you put filet on that burn, it's going to stick and goo to the burn. <laughs> yeah. so, so, and my aunt almost lost the foot, she was so sore after that, but, and my mother was so upset by that because, you know, she had put the filet, but, but that was, all, if you got burned, put a little filet powder on it, though. Or put, I guess if you just have a little bit of a light burn, you do that. But this was a big burn, it's feeling. So I remember in my kitchen, I let three gallons of boiling tea go down my door. So yeah, I'm burned from here to here. And the lady comes, can I put the filet? I said, no, please don't put it. <laughs> <laughs> please don't put it in filet on <laughs> Now you see what I'm doing, I'm adding greens as it cooks down, uh -huh. and that's it. All of these greens would eventually go into the pot, and yeah. then at the end, now Lee, I don't know if y'all did this in, uh, in, in the old days, but once it cooked down to that point, we'd add water to it, the greens will always continue to, uh, uh, to, uh -huh. to add liquid to it. 
and then we would grind it again, or like today we could put it in a food processor and just puree it, on, and all of this would disappear into this green liquid. It was a today. green smooth thing. And we would cook it down like this and put it in a grinder and grind it. You want to taste a little sip of this? Good. How could it not taste good? I did the prep for it. <laughs> <laughs> and you just keep putting your greens in. Well, who wants to come get a little taste? And you know what I do so the people can see the meat that I huh? put that yeah. into the <laughs> meat <laughs> so that the meat cook the in it. Are it's right. really good. It's, I mean, it's already it's already phenomenal, and really think of how basic this is. This is what this is what I think some of these early recipes and some of the early cooks uh, really understood that it's all about the ingredients. Today we're trying the younger chefs out there really out to come into our kitchen and they're coming in with all these ideas, which are great. I mean, that's the same thing we did as young cooks, uh, but they forget. One of the main things, and I drill this into my culinary students at Nickel State uh, all the time. I said, you have to understand the value of the raw ingredient. That's what you're cooking. You're cooking the raw ingredient and bringing it uh, to a point of delivery to the table. And you don't want to start with things that are not that part of the dish. We want to start with the parts. parts. Then we can come back and play with it and make it our own or do well, whatever you want to do with it. But unless you have the base of the, or the origin of the dish, then you're not being true to the dish you're making. Don't call it gumbo zayat, call it something else. Call it a new creation, that's okay. But don't take a dish that is so time honored that comes to us from the Native Americans as well as the Africans and the Creoles and then the Animarians in the city. And uh, so with that, uh, uh, you get you get the, the true flavor and then from that, you can make a, a We've taken this fabulous soup called gumbo zayat that's done on Holy Thursday, and we've pureed that into sauces on the game mm -hmm. dishes. You can imagine that nice smoky flavor with a nice breast of duck or a, or a rabbit or roasted legs. Or we do a, we take this and we debone and stuff a leg of rabbit, and then roast it and put it on the plate with a sauce that has some of that flavor in it. So when you cut into it, and there's this explosion of flavor that. that even the trained chef would say, wow, what the hell is that? What is that? How many times that happens to us, right? When we tell you something, say, what is yeah, that? Why do you think about that in a while? Okay. So the seeds looking good. You see the green? And now you see how it's coming really green? Because the first greens we put in start to cook away, they dull out. Uh, and I have to dish games. And, and, we add. and it takes time. You know, it takes time to prepare good food. You can't cook in a hurry. You know, I tell people if you're in a hurry, put a piece of ham and cheese on bread and eat it. <laughs> Just because it takes time to cook things. You gotta let every like I I never knew what this meant, but the old Creole used to call it mitonne. You let it mitonne. Right. Uh, blend, yeah, blend and something yeah, uh -huh. uh, yeah, so Michelle, we're gonna uh, uh, so I think uh I think everybody sees it. So the next step would be to continue what we're doing for as long as the cook feels comfortable. Uh -huh. Because right now it's ready to eat, it's but that doesn't eat. mean the cook's ready to serve. No. There's a, that's a big difference in Louisiana's Creole and Cajun cooking. We get to a point where we need a little bit, like she says, mitonne, you want it to continue to play and continue to live and continue it to cook. to cook down slow. Low, low. It's only going to get better, is what the topic means. You know, it can't see, get this, worse. See how these greens will cook to nothing? They'll just cook away like this. The more you put them in, put it that way. Oh, oh, Jesus it. Christ. <laughs> I want to stay all day. We got places to go. <laughs> well, you got to make it green. <laughs> you got to make it green. And then, you know, you got to have enough greens in it. And let it just cook down like that, and it's so good over rice. Mm. Uh, Leah, one thing about before we finish the, the demo, because I know we run a little bit late. A little bit, I, I was doing a bad job of telling the story about uh, uh, 
of segregation and what was going on in this restaurant. And you made such a great statement uh, that uh, segregation ended over bowls of gumbo here at uh, Leah Ch at W. Chase. And I think everybody in the world knows that to be true. Uh, you want to say a little bit about that and what was going on at you that know, time? Back in the 60s. Well, it was still, well, I don't know, John, how we served people here, but we were here since 1941. And we always had whites to come in and to, to come in. Well, this is where they had to meet black people. You know, you didn't have, you couldn't meet anywhere else. That was against the law. So they used to meet here. If you had to meet with somebody, you met here. And then, when you were planning things here, that's where the meetings were all. If, if the city council had to meet with the black community, this is where they came. So in the 60s, all the freedom riders who left from here met here. And all we served was a bowl of gumbo and some fried chicken. And they would go out and do whatever they had to do and come back when you came back. Bowl of gumbo and some fried chicken. <laughs> so I say we changed the course of America over a bowl of gumbo and some fried chicken. And maybe we should invite Mr. Trump to have a bowl of gumbo and some fried chicken. <laughs> and he would know what we have to do in this country. So <laughs> they really changed the course of America just talking. You you eat and you talk and you talk things over. And that's what we did right here. And we never had a problem. All the black people will tell you, this restaurant to them was a safe haven. Police never came in this door, ever. They never bothered any of us. And they knew the meetings were going on, but they didn't bother us. So I don't know why, but because back in those days they didn't have black police, but they had only white police. And the police, when my mother-in-law was such a good-hearted person, if the police would be walking beat or walking the neighborhood, she called in, and this is what she said, baby, I'm going to make you a little sandwich. Because they were protecting us and doing this. So she'd make them a sandwich, give them a root beer, and they would go on. So every once in a while they would come, she'd make their sandwich. Today they would call that bribery. <laughs> <laughs> but she did that because she was just appreciative. So maybe that's why they never ever came in this door and they knew the meetings were going on. They knew this one was going to be here. They knew when when King was going to come. They knew when Farmer was going to come. They knew when James Baldwin was going to be here. But they never, ever entered this door. And the, the black people would meet, and they would always say, this is our safe haven. And we just feed them, and they'd go on. Uh, one thing also, and this, this will be the last story, that I, I, I think is so important. Uh, Leah was telling me one day many years ago that there was no place like this for the African-American youngster to learn how to eat in a restaurant. They didn't know what the farts were. They didn't know, they didn't know how to, all of that worked. And, and Leah, by opening the doors here and black families coming in to eat, Leah said that with a white with a tablecloth on the table and all this, that allowed people to understand and know what was going on that they didn't know. This is, they really didn't know. Uh, I remember I, w I was a waitress in the French Quarter. That's how I learned. And I came here and said, we're going to change this whole menu. I said, the only difference, and this was the stupidest thing you ever heard of in your life. I said, the only difference in people color their skin. Well, that was stupid. Different cultures. If you Chinese, you like good Chinese. If you're Italian, you like good. So it's a different thing. But anyway, and I said, we're going to change this menu. First thing I put on is lobster thermidor. <laughs> Those black people said, she's going crazy. <laughs> we, we don't want this cream sauce. We don't want this. But 
that was to me the worst thing about segregation. You were unable to learn. So now you learn, you can go to other restaurants, you learn how to eat cream sauces. So now I can do that if I want to. So that was just one of those things, but it was kind of fun in those days. And today I'm gonna surprise you with a dish that John really likes. He really likes it, and you see it when it comes out. So we'll start you with a little cup of, cup of there. That you can't come here unless you have the stupid fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> the Civil War ended on fried chicken. Fried chicken. We fried so many cases of chicken every day, I'm just tired of fried chicken. <laughs> and you know, well, in this country, we have to stop doing that because years ago, and he knows that, we didn't eat fried chicken every day, we ate it on Sunday. Now you won't eat fried chicken every day, you can't eat that every day. And keep up the pace, you have to keep up. So you gotta back off that fried chicken, but nobody wants to back off the fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> see, I can see you are doing those. Uh, 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 what Leah doesn't know is that, uh, you know, being a, a, a rich Creole in the city of New Orleans, she had fried chicken, but in the country where I was, we had fried raccoon legs. <laughs> <laughs> on Sunday, that was our Sunday. Let's give Leah a big hand, y'all. <laughs>